Okay, so I want to welcome all of you to the uh, annual George Corey Lecture. Uh, this is almost, I think, almost 20 years since we uh, began the George Corey Lecture, and, and during this time, um, for the last uh, seven years or so, um, I wasn't the one who was organizing this, but it was uh, John Brady who, uh, who was uh, the person that uh, organized the George Corey Lecture each year. And John and I were, of course, both postdoctoral fellows with George uh, when we first started. John was the uh, senior person in the lab uh, by the time that I joined George. And so I'm very personal, personally grateful for John uh, in the early days when he was really very instrumental in sort of showing me the ropes at the NIH. And, and for the last several years, John was very uh, ably organizing this lecture. And unfortunately, John passed away earlier this year, uh, several months ago. So before we begin this year's lecture, I just want to show you a picture of John and, and remember uh, John. Uh, I know many of us at the NIH uh, know John very well. Uh, we will miss him, and I certainly will miss him uh, personally. Uh, and it's a great loss uh, to us and to the NIH family. Uh, so with that uh, said, um, let me uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, who will uh, introduce our speaker for today. Well, thanks very much. It is a pleasure and a privilege uh, to be able to welcome all of you to the George Corey Lecture. This is a special occasion uh, for NIH uh, where we bring a, an exceptionally capable speaker uh, to present uh, some new and exciting science uh, at the Wednesday afternoon lecture series, but this is a special one of those. Uh, George Corey, for those of you who uh, do not know his history, uh, was a remarkably productive and uh, wonderfully instrumental uh, leader in uh, tumor viruses in the time that he spent uh, at the NIH in Building 41, uh, where he did uh, really groundbreaking work uh, in that area and mentored a whole host uh, of really uh, remarkable trainees uh, to whom he was quite dedicated. Um, and so he died sadly uh, and unfortunately at age 43 of lymphoma and in his memory uh, this lecture was set up uh, some time after that. We we're fortunate uh, this afternoon uh, that his widow Marilyn Corey uh, has joined us. Uh, thank you for being here uh, Marilyn. I knew George a little bit back when I was a postdoctoral fellow and he was one of those people who just lit up the room and uh, you couldn't have a scientific conversation with George without getting excited about his work and yours because that was the way uh, his personality sort of in an infectious way uh, made science just seem like the most amazing thing that anybody could ever get a chance to do. So it's highly appropriate to recognize him in this way and we're fortunate uh, today uh, to have as a speaker uh, Frank Rauscher uh, from Wistar uh, and uh, Frank will tell you when he gets up here that he has his own George Corey connection, uh, so it's a particularly appropriate choice uh, that he is our speaker today. He's professor and chairman of the Molecular Genetics Program and chair of Wistar Institute's Gene Expression and Regulation Program. Uh, Frank uh, got his PhD at Roswell Park Cancer Institute and did a postdoc uh, with Tom Curran. Uh, he is a very significant figure in cancer research, uh, both in terms of his own laboratory's efforts including the discovery of the WT1 gene uh, that's involved in Wilms tumor, uh, the BAP1 gene involved in BRCA1, and more recently in work that he's going to tell you about today, uh, focusing on epigenetics and the role that that plays uh, in cell biology and particularly in cancer. He's also been for some time editor-in-chief of Cancer Research, uh, the most prominent journal in the field, and I'm sure that is an enormous time sink uh, for him and obviously a great uh, devotion that he puts into making sure that that journal is just as good as it can be, and it is very good indeed. Uh, interestingly, I learned this, and I guess I didn't know it before, uh, that Frank's father, Frank Rauscher, Jr., uh, was the director of the National Cancer Institute uh, when the National Cancer Institute uh, was given the uh, big mandate uh, by President Nixon uh, to declare war on cancer and go forth and solve these problems. So uh, Frank grew up here. Uh, and uh, 
I guess following very much in his father's footsteps now becomes one of those uh, research dynasties uh, that we see occasionally around us. Uh, and it is a great personal privilege and pleasure uh, to be able to welcome him here uh, for this talk. And uh, I guess being a local, he's come up with a title that particularly resonates with those of us who have to deal with traffic around here. The title of his talk is Gridlock on the Genomic Beltway how epigenetic gene silencing shapes our cellular phenotypes. Please welcome Dr. Frank Rauscher. Thanks, Francis. Appreciate it. Well, thanks very much. It really is a, a, a homecoming, uh, uh, and I really appreciate um, actually all of you coming to hear. Hopefully I don't uh, 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 faint while doing this. Uh, uh, but uh, can, uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, Francis, thank you very much for that wonderful uh, 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 introduction. Indeed, uh, I was at what they call an NIH brat uh, uh, because I essentially grew up uh, in these laboratories, sometimes playing softball on the fields over there and uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, candling eggs uh, while chicken retrovirology was in its, uh, uh, part of partially in its heyday. Um, and uh, in my father's labs and other people's labs as well, too. So it's, uh, it's uh, wonderfully back here. I also want to uh, 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 thank T for uh, uh, inviting me uh, for this uh, auspicious occasion. Of course, say hello to Marilyn. I usually see Marilyn, Marilyn Corey once a year, and this year I get the uh, privilege to see her twice a year. Uh, uh, as Francis has pointed out, uh, uh, we at the Worcester Institute have had a, 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 an additional George Corey Memorial Lecture. Uh, and this year, are we okay? Uh, uh, th this year um, is the 20th year, I think, 19th or 20th year for the Wistar Institute Memorial uh, uh, Lecture. And uh, 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 Dr. Corey was a, uh, was a, um, a trustee of the Hassel Foundation, which is a, a local foundation in Philadelphia, but very well loved. And they established this uh, lectureship in his uh, uh, honor uh, essentially 20 years ago. And, and I was given uh, as a very junior uh, faculty member uh, um, uh, uh, the wonderful thing of organizing it every year. And uh, many of the speakers uh, have overlapped. Uh, Tia has been uh, to see us as well, too. So uh, uh, as Francis has already said, George was a really beloved colleague. I did not know him. I, I probably crossed paths while I was 12 years old with him or something uh, here. But uh, uh, in, 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 in hearing tributes of George from the speakers, most, most of uh, we, we, uh, whom were his trainees, uh, 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 the thing that really resonates was his, his ability to as Jim Alwine would say, light up the room and having a conversation with him would just light up your mind. And he apparently led by simply being George and having superb ideas which were essentially followed through on uh, 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 in, 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 a, in, in a superb manner. I think, T, you would, you would agree with me on that. But he, he was that, one of those superb leaders that, that come along once in a very few, a few, a few times. And uh, uh, I think he made an enormous uh, uh, impact. This is the only uh, file picture I could find, uh, Marilyn. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I, 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 I wish I had um, uh, uh, known him in a professional manner. So in, in any event, uh, uh, thanks again uh, uh, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you uh, just a short story, uh, because I know we don't want to uh, finish on time. Uh, on uh, one of the major th uh, themes of my laboratory, uh, and that is how gene silencing works, and hence the, the title Gridlock. I was told to make a snappy title, uh, uh, so they would, they, would, they would draw people in, and this is the only thing, having been, um, at, uh, uh, been living in, 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 in the Washington area for 25 years, the, the Beltway continues to resonate in, in one's uh, 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 mind. Uh, in any event, uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the work we've been doing on, on, on silencing in eukaryotic cells, in, in mammalian cells. How does this work? How can we take three quarters of the genome in fully differentiated tissues and silence it for the life of the organism and uh, keep that, that silence and, and maintain it during mitosis, during uh, 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 meiosis? And what are the mechanisms, biochemical mechanisms, that are utilized to maintain heritably uh, gene silencing uh, uh, in, uh, in, in those cells? We also know that uh, uh, when that silencing mechanism is deregulated, that, are, that is genes that should, 
should be off for the life of the organism are upregulated, uh, 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 there are pathologic consequences, uh, uh, many of which are, are cancers. And, uh, and I'll get to that. So uh, 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 before I uh, start, where's the pointer here? I want to just, I always forget this slide at the end. I just want to show the people that did uh, a lot of this work. David Schultz and Mark, Mark Lechner with both, and Kaz Orion on Athen were, uh, were all postdocs in my lab. They all have their own laboratories uh, 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 by themselves right now. Uh, William Fredericks uh, is, is in the lab, uh, and he, he did a lot of the uh, um, uh, 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 crab domains, uh, uh, silencing stuff, I'll tell you. Hong Zhang Peng, uh, along with Kathy Borden's laboratory in Montreal, will do, has done a lot of the crystallography in NMR uh, that I'll show you. Uh, and Alexei Ivanov, uh, uh, who just has his own, uh, own laboratory, uh, but does not yet have a grant uh, in uh, uh, West Virginia, um, uh, did uh, uh, most of the simulation stuff that I'll tell you uh, 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 about. And, um, uh, uh, Ramin Shikatar and Gerd Moll are from the Wistar, uh, and they've done uh, helped uh, a lot with the uh, uh, the biochemistry. So uh, uh, we've just been uh, interested in, in in how you get from uh, essentially how how do you get from coordinated activation, repression, and stable silencing of gene expression, uh, and how it governs all of these cell processes from very early uh, 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 patterning uh, to, uh, 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 to birth of the organism to uh, 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 a punk rock skateboarder uh, here. This is Frank J. Rauscher IV, and uh, as I was speaking with Francis, he says, uh, is there going to be any kind of dynasty here? And uh, um, I am assured uh, that he's going to become an investment banker uh, uh, instead of a cancer researcher, uh, so, uh, uh, so he can uh, support us. Uh, 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 in his own way. So, so th these, these, the way we, we kind of think about these uh, uh, gene regulation, and that is there's a, 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 um, a set point for gene activity in, in a particular uh, tissue, uh, and uh, uh, it's usually uh, governed by uh, basal chrominin states. Uh, and it, um, the, uh, this, this set point can be activated or repressed, uh, usually by, the, uh, uh, by the, uh, the action of specific DNA binding activation or, trans uh, uh, or repression factors, and you can activate it or, 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 or repress it, and then it reaches another set point and it is maintained then uh, in, uh, uh, over de developmental time. Uh, and we know that, uh, uh, that these, uh, these states, both the set points and uh, uh, the activation and the maintenance are gene genetically separable. This has been shown in flies and yeast and other genetically tractable organisms. So they're separate complexes that uh, govern uh, 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 the maintenance phase uh, 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 of, these, uh, 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 of this activation or repression. And this is what we've been uh, highly interested in. Um, uh, 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 this stable silencing can uh, occur by DNA methylation, for instance, or uh, recruitment of the gene into heterochromin, and other things that I'll talk to you about as well, too. Many of these are due to uh, uh, changes uh, in epigenetics, that is, uh, uh, not uh, 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 direct uh, modifications of uh, uh, histones. Excuse me. So, uh, uh, so, if you're interested in the maintenance mechanism, you'd, you'd want to ask, at what level of chromin structure um, do, uh, uh, do, do they occur? Now, many of us uh, uh, in, 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 in gene regulations, uh, even 20 or 25 years ago when I was a postdoc at, in Tom Curran's lab, thought of DNA in the nucleus as just this right here. You could bind uh, six base pairs of DNA, do a gel shift, and voila. Uh, uh, that's the way gene regulation worked. And we mostly um, pretty much ignored uh, how DNA was packaged, how, how uh, uh, about a meter and a half of DNA uh, is packaged in the nucleus. Uh, and, uh, and both depackaged and repackaged uh, in a highly concerted manner. And, and uh, we pretty much thought that uh, um, uh, the, these were um, uh, mechanisms uh, which simply packaged. We now know they're highly dynamic, uh, uh, and I'll tell you that. And uh, one would like to know whether these maintenance mechanisms uh, work at the level of the mononucleosome, uh, of recruitment to the, of a mononucleosome, which has had about 146 base pairs of DNA, into the 30 nanometer solenoid, and then higher order structures in the nucleus, which we virtually know nothing about uh, 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 compared to uh, what else. And what I'll tell you is, it's probably a combination of all of these mechanisms, both at the, at the mononucleosome and at higher order, that, that this is affected. Now, so what is the role of chromatin structure? 
This is gene regulation in the new millennium. You can't get your grant funded unless you have a uh, nucleosome with a appropriately wrapped DNA around it. Uh, uh, and uh, um, and uh, before gene regulation was essentially a DNA binding domain, which we know a lot about structurally, that recognizes a, a DNA binding site. It contains a separable repression or activation domain. Uh, it would interact directly with a, a, a non-DNA bound co-repressor, which we now know uh, uh, we now know often contains enzymatic activities uh, that modify histones and other proteins, uh, uh, and um, and it directly uh, modifies neighboring nucleosomes, which package the gene. Uh, what I'll tell you also is, uh, you know, uh, another mechanism is that the gene itself is also often recruited spatially into, uh, when it's repressed, into a region of heterochromatin. And here's a simple uh, nucleus stained with uh, hoax or DAPI, I can't remember. And this is a, a, a single integrated gene, which we can uh, uh, visualize. And uh, when, when this, all of this occurs properly, uh, 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 these nucleosomes are very tightly packed and the gene itself uh, uh, is uh, recruited into what Dave Alice would call the, a bad neighborhood for gene expression, uh, and that is in, uh, into heterochromatin. And, and you can imagine it takes a huge amount of energy for a euchromatic gene that is transcribed to be recruited into, uh, 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 physically recruited into, into a region of the nucleus uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of heterochromatin. And that's one mechanism, uh, we think, a major mechanism of, of, uh, of stable gene silencing. So, uh, what are these modifications? So, as I said, uh, histones are modified uh, um, uh, uh, by very specific enzymes. Uh, this has been a cottage industry now for about 15 years, uh, and uh, it is a, a really a revolution in our, our understanding of, of gene expression. And uh, it's, it been, it's been known for essentially eons that the N-terminal tails, uh, and actually uh, the core regions of uh, uh, the nucleosome, uh, are modified post-translationally, just like uh, 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 SARC or, or, or anything else. Uh, 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 and these uh, uh, occur as lysine methylations. It can be monodire tri, arginine methylation, acetylation, which is all, all, often a mark for uh, gene activation, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, lysine methylation, uh, and I'll talk a, a lot about histone 3 lysine 9 methylation, which was one of the best marks for um, silencing a gene and recruiting it to heterochromatin. Uh, and you can see you can have uh, uh, different marks on, uh, on, this, on, on the same lysine as well, too. Uh, phosphorylation uh, and ubiquination. So this constellation of, of, uh, uh, of modifications, which you see on separate nucleosomes, governs what the DNA, which is not shown here, does, essentially. And this is, uh, constitutes the uh, histone code hypothesis uh, coined uh, uh, by Dave Allison and a few others. And that is that this combinatorial set of modifications that you see governs how the DNA that's wrapped around here will be metabolized. Is it transcribed? Is it repressed? Is it replicated? Uh, is it uh, uh, repaired? Et cetera. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and this is pretty much the, epigen uh, the main part of the epigenetic code, which does not involve the DNA, but it involves the packaging uh, uh, of the D DNA. And uh, um, this is kind of a, a revolution in gene expression. So we, uh, uh, we were interested uh, uh, in this by studying, the, uh, uh, um, by studying the proteins I just showed you, DNA binding proteins. And as Francis pointed out, I started working uh, uh, on uh, WT1, one of, one of the third uh, tumor suppressor gene that was cloned uh, uh, after RB and P53. Um, uh, when Tom Kerr, my postdoctoral advisor, advised me uh, um, when I was leaving the lab that uh, um, I would never uh, survive as a scientist if I, if I worked on Foss and June, because he was, he was working on it. Uh, and he handed me this journal cell and he said, they just cloned this tumor suppressor gene. It has four zinc fingers, you might want to work on it. <laughs> so I, I took his advice. <laughs> and uh, that's how he got into studying uh, these zinc finger proteins. And this is what I'll tell you about. And uh, anybody uh, who's, who's a genomic sequencer, these are the bane of genomic sequencers because there's so many zinc fingers in the human, uh, human genome that you're running into them all the time. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, I'll tell you why in a second. So here's WT1. This is a classic uh, C2H2 zinc finger. 
Each zinc right here represents uh, 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 one zinc molecule bound by about 26 amino acids. Highly uh, 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 specific um, um, uh, structure. Uh, uh, there are NMR structures, crystal structures, uh, uh, what have you. Uh, 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 in the crystal structures, each zinc finger binds about three molecules of, uh, of DNA. So you can see, and the binding site for WT1, for instance, is about nine base pairs of DNA. That's a pretty good recognition site. But we got interested in this other family of genes that have long arrays of zinc fingers. It's remarkable. The winner so far is 38 zinc fingers in a row uh, uh, with a seven amino acid uh, a spacer between each zinc finger. Now, what is a protein that's highly conserved uh, 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 through, through evolution doing with 38 zinc fingers? Uh, uh, is, it re is it using all those fingers to recognize DNA? Are part of them uh, used to recognize RNA? RNA-DNA hybrids? Uh, or, uh, or is it a nucleic acid binding protein at all? Uh, so, so very little is known about DNA binding sites for these long array zinc fingers. Uh, 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 a finger like this with uh, nine zinc fingers could recognize, you know, maybe 30 base pairs of DNA, which was remarkable. One possibility is that some of these uh, long array fingers are dedicated zinc fing dedicated transcription factors. That is, their specificity for DNA binding is so, is so high that they only recognize uh, a very small subset of genes. And in fact, that's borne out by studies of the, uh, the expression of some of these that has shown that some of them are turned on and utilized in, in very small windows of development in a very tissue-specific manner. Sorry. And, uh, 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 and, and so they can only control uh, 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 one small metabolic pathway, for instance, or developmental pathway. Uh, we got interested in, in these things because we showed that WT1 is a repressor, and it was one of the first um, uh, repression domains that were defined in, uh, in mammalian cells. That is, you could take the N terminus of WT1, fuse it to GAL4, Lexa, whatever you want, and it'll, it'll, create, uh, it'll turn a DNA binding protein into a repressor. And that is not a... Uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, a passive repressor that is like by occluding an activator, but an active repressor by specifically recruiting proteins that repress the locus. And, and that was a, a, a kind of a new concept too. And by and large, the rest of these proteins shown here, which are categorized by both having C-terminal zinc fingers and an N-terminal uh, repression domain. And these are the three major classes of those. Excuse me. Kidding. Uh, uh, there, uh, and they occur in, in families. Uh, the BTB pause domain is found in quite a lot of proto oncogenes in the human. BCL6, which causes leukemia, PLZF, uh, lymphoma, PLZF, which is causes uh, 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 APL, leukemia. And there are about 80 of these uh, uh, in the human proteome. There are about more than 500 of these. They all have crab domains. This is about, this is about 250 amino acids. We've solved the crystal structure of this. Uh, this is about 75 amino acids. It's completely unstructured in solution, uh, but it becomes structured when it binds its co-repressor. And the snag domain, which occurs in these, uh, 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 it's only about 12 amino acids. And if you fuse this to the end terminus or a protein, it can make it a, a very strong repressor. Uh, and this, these occur in GFI1, growth factor independence 1, the snail and slug family of proteins, which are very important in the EMT uh, metastasis process uh, uh, processes. Uh, as well, too, uh, and uh, uh, and I'll speak a little bit about all of these, but mostly we've we've functioned on how does this crab repression domain work? You have 500 of these things. This crab domain is almost completely conserved, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, one of the um, most highly represented motifs. This is an example of what we'd uh, think of as a dedicated repressor uh, with a, a long array of proteins. This is ENF202. It was mapped by uh, um, people at Novartis uh, as a, a candidate uh, dyslipidemia pathway in a, large, uh, a bunch of large uh, Utah pedigrees. It's at 11Q23. It has, as I told you, a long, a long array of zinc fingers as a crab domain. It also has a scan domain, which I won't talk about, which is essentially a dimerization domain. But uh, uh, they uh, uh, identified a pretty good consensus sequence for this. You can see it's really very G-rich, but this spacing of T's is very important as well, too. And when you look for this sequence, you only find it in promoters uh, 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 that control uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the metabolism uh, of lipids. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it 
therefore is a very good candidate for this dyslipidemia uh, 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 phenotype. Uh, uh, and uh, it's an example of having a single protein recognizing a long uh, consensus sequence. And this is very long uh, 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 if you've come from the DNA binding uh, uh, protein standpoint. And seemingly, seemingly only occurs in uh, 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 a single uh, metabolic pathway. So, what is the, uh, the uh, I told you one of, one of these domains is the, uh, is the B2B pause domain. And about five years ago, uh, we started fooling around with it. Uh, uh, and we took a, 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 a P, PLZF because it's a pretty good repression event. It's, it's about 250 amino acids from the human. And we uh, uh, expressed it uh, as a his protein. And it was, uh, uh, it, it expressed overnight, essentially. It was soluble to about 70 milligrams per ml with no futzing. And we gave it to our, our resident crystallographer, uh, Ronan Marmerstein, and it crystallized overnight uh, 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 with no futzing, which that never happens, uh, as a, any of you know. And we were able to uh, derive the crystal structure shown here. Uh, and it's a very inter interesting structure. Uh, it has this, uh, it's, it's a dimer. You can see it has these crossed uh, loops huge dimerization interface here. It has this uh, uh, cleft right here, and this cleft is where it binds uh, the co-oppressor NCOR and SMART. Uh, and in fact, when this PLZF is fused to the retinoic acid receptor, it causes a, a retinoic acid resistant variant of, of acute promyelocytic leukemia. Uh, and, in, and in fact, if you disrupt this interaction right here at this, at this cleft, uh, you can uh, uh, reverse that retinoic acid resistance. And in fact, there's some very good peptidum and mimetic inhibitors uh, that are targeting this right here. Uh, unfortunately, there are only about 10 cases per year of this, this variant uh, of uh, APL, but uh, it serves a, a, as a model. Um, uh, this, this is, uh, uh, I'm not going to show you any data on this, uh, but this is uh, the SNAG domain. And again, you only find it at the extreme end terminus of uh, um, genes like growth factor independence one. Uh, and this was first cloned by uh, Phil Sickles' lab. It has zinc fingers in the C terminus. By and large, these are uh, all repressors. You can see it's conservation here, MPRS FLVK. Um, it's, uh, uh, to, this is 21 amino acids, but to make it, to, at the repression domain is only the first 12 amino acids, which is a transferable repression domain. So we thought that was uh, pretty cool to um, actually look at. And we've worked out how this uh, 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 domain works. And I'm not going to show you any of the data. Uh, uh, I hope you trust me uh, in that. Uh, uh, but we now know uh, we've walked down the pathway. And it involves arginine methylation through PRMT5, which is arginine methyltransferase 5. Uh, and uh, uh, it occurs along with, a, with essentially a chaperone called MEP50, which allows it to attach to local chromatin. So you have a, a snag domain attached to, for instance, snail, uh, which is a very important uh, protein in metastasis and EMT. The snag domain directly binds another protein, which is the co-repressor. It's a limb domain protein called a juba. Uh, and, and this limb domain uh, is also a, uh, um, uh, a, 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 a cysteine zinc binding region. It binds directly to the snag domain. Uh, and, uh, it, and in turn, a juba binds to this arginine methyltransferase. It lays down. Uh, uh, a methylation mark on arginines, on histones, and uh, silences uh, locally the, uh, the gene. There are now uh, PRMT5 uh, inhibitors, uh, which uh, may uh, turn out to be very important, both in prevention of metastasis uh, and in, 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 th in, in therapeutics. Again, snail and slug proteins are one of the few proteins that are upregulated very strongly during the metastatic process. So it's a, it's a dominant gain of function, uh, which makes it a very attractive drug target. Uh, uh, instead of loss of function. So that's uh, uh, all, all I'll say about that. Um, what I will talk about is this, because we worked out this pathway uh, for a, a, a number of years now, for about six or seven years now. So again, this crab's zinc finger is there's a super family of transcriptional repressors. It's the largest family of gene silencers in the human proteome. Uh, at last count, there were more than 530 of these. Uh, uh, and they all have the exact same uh, um, um, uh, structure. C terminals, uh, different zinc fingers, which presumably provide specificity, and an N terminal crab domain, which is high uh, of 75 amino acids, highly uh, conserved. And uh, 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 um, we went about asking uh, uh, if, it, if it has a common function, 
uh, it must have a common uh, uh, cofactor. And we went, uh, uh, an MD-PhD student in my lab, Josh Friedman, went about purifying this the old-fashioned way over columns. Uh, and uh, uh, he, um, uh, he, uh, uh, he cloned uh, this gene, and it's called, we call it CAP1. We wanted to call it CRAP1 for crab-associated protein, but the journal wouldn't let us. So we uh, uh, changed it to uh, CAP1. So CAP1 is the, a dedicated co-repressor for this long uh, array, uh, 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 large array of proteins. Every one of these uh, binds directly to CAP1. Uh, it, uh, 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 as I'll show you, it modifies histones. It recruits genes into heterochromin. Uh, and um, and, and uh, uh, the most important thing, this is not like NCOR and SMART or RB that talk to many, many different transcription factors. This, is, this, this protein is dedicated to a single class of, tr of transcription factors that have crab domains. And uh, if you not, if, as you can imagine, if you knock it out, it's, embryo it's embryonic lethal very early on. This was shown by Pierre Chambon, who is uh, uh, my major competitor in this field. And uh, uh, so it's, it's highly uh, uh, important. So this is what it looks like. It has a bunch of domains, and it's a member of a family like everything is. Uh, uh, in the N-terminus, it has what we call an RBCC domain, ring, B-box, coiled coil. This is a long region of, um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, leucine zipper-like coiled coil, and it trimerizes the protein. So this is a homotrimer, which you rarely see, actually, and uh, a ring finger, which participates in binding to the crab domain. So this is, this is the crab interaction domain. This is simply a protein-protein interaction domain. Uh, I might say also that in this context, the ring finger is not an E3 ligase for ubiquination or anything. It's, it's structural for binding uh, to, to the crab domain. Uh, this is the business end of the molecule, and it has three separate repression domains which uh, 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 work. One binds heterochromin proteins, and it has a PhD and a bromo domain, which many of you have probably heard of. The bromo domain is involved in recognition of the histone modifications directly. We now know that the PhD domain in other proteins is involved uh, in recognition sometimes. But what I'll show you is this PhD domain, which is also cysteine histine rich, is actually an E3 ligase for sumulation. And uh, 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 this PhD domain is an intramolecular E3 ligase for sumulation of the bromo domain. And it's the first time that. Uh, um, that uh, you have the E3 uh, uh, ligase uh, adjacent uh, to um, its substrate, the bromo domain. And this spacing is critical, and I'll show you what that is. Uh, uh, the other members of the family, you can see TIF1 alpha, TIF1 gamma, and PML, uh, which is, causes leukemia as well, too, are members of, the, of this RBC safe family. Uh, but they uh, they're also occur as oligomers, but uh, they don't uh, cross dimerize. So there's, there's a lot of specificity to this. So uh, let me just show you some biochemistry we've done over the ages trying to get the structure of this. This is uh, uh, the RBCC domain of CAP1 uh, on a gel filtration column, and this is the, uh, a monomer of the crab domain. Here's free crab domain, and here's in the complex. And you can get a beautiful three to one complex, a trimer of CAP1 with uh, uh, a monomer uh, of, um, uh, of the crab domain. We don't know how that molecular recognition occurs, uh, when uh, the crab domain by, uh, is by itself, it's, un it's disordered. It's unstructured completely. And when it binds, it becomes structured. So it's a kind of lock and key mechanism, which we think is important. This complex right here is totally uncrystallizable. It is, it, it is so ill-behaved. Uh, and uh, I've, I've wasted a lot of the genomes of postdocs trying to get this to um, crystallize. So we've stopped that. In any event, you can... Uh, um, the business end of the molecule is, is here, uh, and uh, 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 it's cooperative. Both these uh, uh, domains uh, uh, co cooperate in repression. So here, if you can take this PhD and bromo domain, fuse it to GAL4, it's a, a very good repressor. If you make a mutation which disrupts the PhD domain, uh, it's, it's a very poor repressor. Uh, if you take either domain alone, they're very poor repressors as well, too. So these things must be adjacent, uh, and they cooperate in, uh, in, in gene silencing. And, uh, um, so what is the bromo domain? Uh, uh, these structures have been around for a while. Uh, 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 this is the, uh, one of the first ones, GCGD and uh, uh, actually PCAF right here. It's a four uh, beta barrel uh, structure. It forms this BCZA cleft, and this is what recognizes modifications in histones. 
Uh, so it forms this cleft. Sometimes you find tandem bromodomains, as in TAF 250. So you have the, uh, both BCZA domains, one's here and one's here. So you have the ability to combinatorial recognize two uh, modifications on, on a histone, um, uh, which you'd like uh, if you're going to uh, uh, interpret whatever the histone code is. Uh, uh, and in fact, here, here, the BCZA cleft is here in GCN5, and you can see uh, an acetylated peptide bound right here to the GC cleft. So this is, the, this is the PhD domain structure. This is adjacent to the bromo domain, as I showed you. Uh, we solved this by NMR with Kathy Borden about five years ago, and it essentially is a ring finger. Uh, it binds two molecules of zinc, shown here. It has this hydrophobic core. It has an uh, unstructured region shown here. And you can see the PhD finger, which is the consensus is C4HC3, and the ring finger is C3HC4. And you can virtually overlay them uh, on this, but there's a huge amount of specificity there. Um, so it got us thinking about, is the PhD domain mediating ubiquination, which many E3 ligases do, like ring fingers, or does it mediate other things? And what I'll show you is that this PhD domain from CAP1 is uh, mediate sumulation instead of a ubiquination. And it's critical for silencing. So we uh, were highly interested in, in, in what is the structure of these tandem, uh, tandem doma domains. You very often find tandem PhD and bromo domains in chromatin-associated proteins. So they must be doing something. Uh, and uh, prior to uh, our studies, um, there was a, a little known about their structure. So Ming Ming Zhao and our labs decided to solve it, uh, the structure, and this is, um, this is published. Uh, uh, actually, this is an old slide, and this is what they look like. So here's the, uh, 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 they're, they're independently folded domains, but they pack very tightly against one another. Uh, here's the BCZA cleft, so it, it can recognize, it's free to recognize uh, uh, a modification in histones. The PhD domain is here, here are the two molecules of zinc, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, it also forms this cleft right here, which also has the capability of, uh, of recognizing a modification. And we don't know what that modification is yet, but it's another example of you know, a module that cooperates that can recognize combinatorially modifications uh, in histones, which is uh, uh, very important. So these things pack very tightly together, and they do so through this very small leucine zipper. Leucine uh, 653, 709, and 668. You can see they stick out. They form a nice, small, greasy pocket. And trust me, the last thing I ever want to work on is another leucine zipper. But uh, uh, this is what uh, uh, nature has given us. Uh, and they pack very tightly. Uh, if you mutate these to alanines, uh, these domains remain folded, but they don't, they don't contact one another. They're, they're not like this. And, so, um, and they no longer, uh, it's no longer a repressor either. Um, so uh, uh, these domains must uh, uh, maintain uh, 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 intactness uh, to function uh, as a silencing unit. And that's what we're trying to find out uh, what it does right now. But I'll tell you that the punchline is that this is the E3 ligase. It binds an E2, and it uses, and the E2 mediates simulation of these lysines here, K676, and the most important one is 779. And simulation at those residues is required for gene silencing. And it does so by protein-protein modification. So while we were doing this work, Dave Alice and his colleagues from, uh, um, uh, and, and Bob Rader uh, uh, from Rockefeller were uh, also working on PhD and bromo domains from another protein, BPTF. And they solved this structure. And it was both as an NMR structure and as a uh, crystal structure. And it has a dramatically different structure. Uh, and in fact, both domains, both the PhD finger and the bromo domain, can recognize modified histones. And you can see they're spread out by a long, rigid helical linker, um, uh, instead of being packed very tightly together. So it's remarkable that, uh, that the uh, um, uh, uh, nature would uh, use both, those, both these tandem domains in, in wildly different structures uh, for, for different uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, and in fact, uh, this type of um, uh, arrangement uh, can be either an activator or a repressor, depending on what type of modification is bound uh, here. So this, again, has the ability to interpret combinatorial marks uh, in, in, uh, in histones. So in, uh, in about uh, five, five or ten minutes, let me uh, tell you uh, a little bit about um, uh, uh, how these things work. So I showed you the structure, I showed you that they cooperate, and uh, I will um, 
and we went about looking for effectors uh, which uh, uh, may function uh, in this context. And uh, we went fishing, uh, of course, and we caught uh, 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 a few big ones, uh, we think. First of all, as one would expect, uh, 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 you must deacetylate histones uh, 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 before replacing uh, a mark, placing a, a silencing mark. And we purified um, uh, the histone deacetylase complex, NERD, N-U-R-D, uh, which has two histone deacetylases, another other accessory proteins, a helicase, and this, this helicase binds directly to a region uh, in the PHC and bromo domain and mediates histone deacetylation. The second protein that we, that we cloned was a, a protein called SETDB1, and this is a histone methyl transferase. So this is a protein that has a Tudor domain, it has a, a cysteine, a SET domain, which comes from SUVAR, enhancer of zest, and trithorax from flies. And this SET domain is enzymatically active, and it places this lysine trimethyl lysine 9 mark on histone H3, highly specific enzyme. And uh, uh, that is uh, one of the best marks for uh, gene silencing there is. Genes that, are, uh, uh, that have this mark, their histones are recruited to heterochromatin. Sorry. So, so that, oh, let me just show you the specificity of these things. It's really remarkable. This is the enzymatic activity of SETDB1. This is histone uh, GST H3, just the enzymal tail. And these are histones in, um, uh, uh, in, in nucleosomes, you know, essentially. And these are just uh, the Kumasi gels right here. Here's the enzyme itself. Uh, and you can see it's highly specific. Uh, and we've mapped this to uh, a lysine uh, uh, K9. So um, uh, the set domain is, is, is highly specific uh, for this, uh, this mark. So the final thing uh, we would like, what I wanted to know and was a answered by somebody else besides us is if you place a lysine 9 methylation mark, uh, which is a silencing mark, something must read that mark. Is it a, another bromo domain? Is it something else? And it turns out it's, it's, it's a heterochromin protein. And this has been known for about five years now as well, too. And heterochromin proteins have been known in flies for a long, long time. Uh, three quarters of the, uh, of the fly genome is heterochromatin, uh, uh, which is megabases of DNA, and it's coded by uh, 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 heterochromatin proteins, uh, and which we call HP1 proteins. Now, there are three flavors of uh, uh, heterochromatin proteins in the human, HP1, alpha, beta, and gamma, uh, and essentially they're bifunctional crosslinkers. So here, the chromodomain, uh, uh, in, so this is, this, is the, this is the heterochromatin protein right here, HP1, alpha, its chromodomain recognizes directly lysine, uh, uh, trimethylated lysine 9 on histone H3. Its chromo shadow domain, and I don't know who uh, came up with this nomenclature, uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is an obligate dimer that has this groove right here, and it recognizes these effector proteins, one of which is CAP1, which I just showed you. And it recognizes this sm small peptide sequence, PXVXL. And, uh, and, and that's all that's required to recruit a gene bound by these into heterochromatin, uh, into a gene that is, uh, uh, that, that, that is modified and wrapped around histone H3 in a, in a nucleosome. So th those are the effectors uh, for, uh, um, for, um, for uh, uh, modification. So this is the system that we've uh, um, uh, uh, uncovered over the last six or seven years. We have long erasing finger proteins with the crab domain, again, it has a universal co-repressor, which is non-DNA bound, but it coordinates all these activities. And it, it first uh, uh, recruits, so the object of these proteins is to silence, uh, uh, silence genes. It does so by first deacetylating the genes, removing the activation marks, essentially, recruiting another uh, 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 histone modification, set db one which remethylates those, those lysines. Uh, uh, affecting uh, um, condensation. And then it brings in uh, physically the protein that recognizes the methylation, the HP1, uh, which, uh, 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 which directly recognizes the histone methylation I just showed you. And, and, uh, in, in, it, and uh, in some fashion, which we don't know yet, the gene that's, that's being bound right here uh, is physically asso associated with heterochromatin, which is highly uh, enriched in HPK9 and in uh, uh, HP1 proteins. So we don't know, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, a supposition of, of temporal events, 
Uh, but I think it's, 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 it's reasonable that, uh, that uh, these occur. Now, what, what we're really interested in working on now is how HPA1 is directly uh, deposited uh, in, uh, on the gene when it, uh, when it, when it is here. Um, another very important point here, and, uh, and it, it, it goes back to um, uh, seemingly eons of studies of heterochromin in flies, and that is uh, once heterochromin is nucleated, it spreads. And, it, and, and, uh, it, and this is known through the, through the studies of position effect variegation uh, and things like that. This is different. These genes, uh, uh, even though you're using a lot of the uh, uh, mechanisms uh, to establish heterochromin, you're really establishing them on a, on a euchromatic gene. This, this, you can take a highly uh, uh, transcribed gene, nucleate this structure on it, um, place the marks and silence the gene, and uh, for all intents and purposes, it's heterochromatic, by, uh, even in location. <coughs> but it doesn't spread. It, does, it, it, it stays where it is. And in fact, uh, we've mapped this to three or four nucleosomes hovered over the uh, um, uh, transcription start site. And it does not spread to adjacent transcriptional units, even within, say, a KB, a couple of nucleosomes away. So either there are, 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 um, are very specific uh, insulators or something, or, uh, 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 or this is a new type of what we call intercalary heterochromatin. That is, it's, uh, uh, it's assembled on a euchromatic gene and, um, uh, and it's very localized. And the question then becomes, uh, uh, is it, uh, 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 becomes, because much, much of classic, uh, what we call facultative heterochromatin is, uh, um, is not reversible. This must be reversible. And what are the mechanisms uh, to do that uh, is something that we're uh, kind of working on. So um, I think uh, I have uh, five more minutes T or, or what? Uh, let me show you just a little bit uh, uh, on the simulation story, which we've been working on. This was published in Molecular Cell last year. Uh, and we got to th uh, thinking about this PhD domain, which is ring finger-like. And we know ring fingers uh, from the work actually done here at NCI, NIH, um, uh, are uh, E3 ligases for, uh, and provide specificity for ubiquination and simulation that maybe uh, 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 um, this PSD domain uh, could be an E3 ligase activity. Uh, and so we went about looking for it. And, um, and SUMO, uh, just uh, as, a, uh, as an example, is a, uh, is, a, uh, is a protein highly related to ubiquitin. Uh, and it's processed almost the exact same way. It's a proprotein of 101 amino acid. It's modified to an active form, transferred through an E1, E2, and then an E3 system, and then it's monosimulated to a substrate. And there are sumos proteases that take it the other way, that can take it off. So this is a highly dynamic process, just like phosphorylation, but it occurs on lysines. And, uh, and instead of uh, uh, delivering this like ubiquitination does to the, uh, to the, to the, to the um, uh, proteasome uh, for degradation, it modifies protein function. And it does so by modifying protein-protein interactions, enzymatic activity, localization of the protein in the cell, et cetera. So we were highly interested in whether um, CAP1 would be simulated in a PhD domain-dependent manner. So we went about looking for it. And this is uh, uh, under appropriate uh, conditions. Uh, 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 you can see simulation uh, um, in cells. And this is monosimulation of CAP1. You can see about a 16 kilodalton change in mobility uh, on an SDS page gel. This can be done, uh, 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 this is e more easily seen here, whereas you have uh, uh, a ladder of uh, 16 kilodalton modifications indicating uh, multiple monosimulation sites. And uh, uh, the beauty is this can be done in vitro with totally recombinant proteins at a very, at a very high frequency. So this is recombinant full-length CAP1 uh, uh, with recombinant E1, E2, and P32 sumo, uh, and ATP. And you can see it's uh, uh, um, highly uh, modified by sumo. Uh, this is referred to as the Sigma catalog uh, experiment because you, you can buy all these. Uh, and it works extremely uh, uh, well. And this simulation requires this interaction right here. I don't, I'm not going to have time to show you the data, but if, if you take these leucines and convert them to alanines, 
as I told you, these domains are still folded, but they don't interact with one another. And, and uh, the protein is no longer simulated. And the major simulation site is this lysine 779 right here. That must be simulated to uh, uh, affect um, uh, silencing. And it's, uh, you can see it's in quite a, a, a close proximity to this BCZA cleft and this cleft right here. So presumably, as a, as a modification, not a phosphorylation, but a, a 97 amino acid modification has the ability to affect whatever's being recognized uh, right here in, in the appropriate context. We don't know that. So um, this is highly specific, too, uh, to uh, CAP1 and two repressor proteins. T, give me the, give me the heads up, all right? Uh, uh, these are uh, three, other, uh, uh, three other PhD bromine domain proteins. That have the exact same uh, uh, that have the exact same uh, layout, uh, a PhD domain, a linker, and then a bromo domain, uh, and these are all made in E. coli, uh, shown here, and purified. Uh, but uh, in the in vitro system, only Cap1 is simulated, shown here, and the other ones are not simulated at all. This is just background. Uh, so, uh, um, and these are uh, 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 none of these are repressors either. Uh, so this is specific to uh, a PhD in bromo domain layout that uh, uh, is monosimulated uh, and is a repressor. And so this, is a, this forms actually a beautiful laboratory for doing s swaps and switches and mutations to see what are the, what are the determinants for uh, uh, making uh, uh, simulation occur. And it turns out this linker region is quite critical right here, this spacer region, and particularly determines in the PhD domain uh, which bind the E2 which is the second. And in fact, we know that uh, 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 all E2s have to bind um, their, uh, let me skip through some of these things. So is this important uh, uh, for repression at all? So we uh, systematically went through and mutated uh, every lysine that could be an acceptor uh, for uh, uh, silencing. We did it uh, in combination, and you, you can see uh, 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 we, we left only one lysine among all of these uh, potential acceptor sites in the PhD and Bromo domain. And if you have all lysines, uh, it's a very, very good repressor. If you kill all of the lysines and ch change them to arginine, uh, you no longer have a repressor that works at all. It's back background uh, versus uh, Lex A. And you can see there's a hierarchy of which lysines uh, are, are most important for, and this is seven, uh, uh, 779 right here. So you require simulation uh, for gene silencing. Uh, and uh, um, let, me, let, me, let me skip that. And, uh, and you can recapitulate this using siRNA as well, too. So what we've done here is taking shRNAs to cap one, and you can very efficiently knock down this, this protein shown here. And this is uh, shown here. K4 is just a cell line, a clonal cell line that contains an shRNA that's very efficient at not knocking down cap one, shown here. Then you can complement with a protein uh, 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 that has, uh, 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 that is resistant to the, um, the shRNA, uh, and if you complement wild type, you get very nice uh, 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 induction of repression. If you complement with a mutation in, in, in the PhD domain, it's drastically reduced. If you complement with a protein that uh, has all lysines uh, uh, that are, are mutated, you get no uh, 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 change in, in, uh, at all in, uh, um, in, uh, um, in, in, uh, in repression. And all these proteins are very stably made. Uh, and it's, this is important because uh, simulation, again, in this context, has nothing to do with proteosomal degradation. It has everything to do with monosimulation and protein-protein interactions. So, uh, uh, as I told you, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, e, the E3 is the PhD domain, and the E2 in the cascade is UBC9. All right, and, uh, uh, and, and here is uh, uh, a dimeric complex of uh, the PhD domain and UBC9. We're solving the structure of this right now. This is the NMR structure, but from chemical shift analyses, we can tell where it binds. And as you'd expect, uh, these are, the, uh, uh, these are the, uh, the, the molecules, these are the, uh, 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 the amino acids on the other side uh, of, the, uh, uh, of CAP1, which bind UBC9 and place its enzymatic activity very close to um, uh, lysine 779, which is in this cleft right here. So we're hoping to get that structure uh, very soon. Just uh, to give you a, a sense of how this would look, uh, we, have, we have one major, which is shown here, a simulation site. And again, this is not, not a phosphorylation. This, this modification is almost as big as the bromo domain spatially itself. 
Uh, and uh, there are two minor simulation sites as well, too. So these type of modifications have a huge uh, ability to modify protein-protein uh, interactions uh, uh, based on uh, wh wh where they're put. And of course, this is modeled. We don't know this is a, a recognition, but this could easily swing over and include this BCZA cleft uh, or recruit uh, 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 new uh, uh, molecules here. And in data, that which I won't have time to show you, uh, 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 this simulation uh, directly recruits uh, the uh, histone methyltransferase and uh, the histone deacetylase complexes, uh, which we've mapped, and that's uh, all published. So I will stop here because I'm late, uh, and uh, I will um, thank you for your, your attention. And uh, I apologize for uh, croaking a bit because uh, I'm a little dry. Thank you very much. I'm a little bit unclear about the role of zinc figure proteins in sequence of events which eventually lead to repressed, repressed chromatin. Now, I understood that the zinc figure proteins recruit, am I correct in that, recruit methyl transferases. Yes. They, they in turn methylate the histone. Yes. And then other protein, HAP1, for example, come and recognizes a methylated histone. Right. That in turn recruits other modifying proteins like STAC. So the question now is that what is the role of zinc finger in the second step after so, HAP has been uh, That's a very good question. Uh, so we think that uh, uh, since this is a transferable repression domain, you can put it on any DNA binding domain, uh, uh, that the zinc finger region itself, a, a long array of zinc fingers that are in the C terminus, we think all that does is provide specificity for the gene that's being targeted. All right, uh, uh, and, uh, um, and instead of having, a, uh, our thought is that y you have a lot of DNA recognition potential in one protein, as opposed to having a number of different proteins, which we know from the study of AP1 and MYC and FOSS and all that stuff, that recognize very small consensus sequences. They all interact to recognize uh, on a particular promoter, uh, but the zinc finger region we think uh, um, is there simply to recognize DNA sequence specifically and has no, no catalytic activity. Last week, Science had a uh, paper showing some interesting features of chromatin in the three-dimensional nucleus, uh, which uh, using this high C approach, are we gonna be able to sort out epigenetics without having a better handle on what's going on in three dimensions? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, Dr. Collins, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I think I, I think it's going to be a chicken and the egg. It's of course the the chicken and the egg story is is is, lo, is location. Uh, yeah, three dimensional location in the, in the cell going to govern um, uh, what modifications occur, uh, whether they're reversible and whether they're uh, you know uh, attainable, for instance, or or, or is or is it vice versa. Um, experimentally, it's going to be continued to be reagent-driven completely, you know. And, and I, I think once we work out the code, the combinatorial code of recognizing ten modifications on a set of nucleosomes, we'll be mu mu much farther there. Well, there are refreshments, I've been told, in the south lobby. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.